Okay. Uh, so good to go. Okay. Uh, good morning uh, and thank you for coming. Uh, uh, so I am Derya Can Sever. Uh, I am the program manager of uh, multi-agent network control at the uh, U.S. Army Research Office. So I'll be talking about some thoughts about, you know, on how reinforcement learning may evolve in the future, which may or may not be relevant, but you know, <laughs> I'll talk about it anyways. And uh, before that, uh, I'll do some uh, shameless advertising about my organization. Uh, so how does this work? Oh. Okay. okay. So, uh, Army Research Office is the uh, Army's primary collaborative link to the worldwide scientific community. So, we are mostly focused on U.S. universities, but we also have uh, funding and uh, working relationship with uh, many universities around the globe. And uh, so our goal is to support basic science uh, that is relevant to the army, not necessarily application, but you know, something that may lead to an application for the army in the future. Uh, so it's basic science. And uh, we are organized in like, 11 uh, areas that they call uh, competencies. I mean, the ITIMOS network, cyber, human systems, uh, electromagnetic spectrum, energy, mechanical, biological, physics, so on and so forth. And, uh, and we have uh, 45 programs uh, that are uh, organized to you know, interact and fund uh, you know, academic research. And uh, I am uh, managing one of them. It's called the multi-agent uh, network control. And uh, it is basically a control theory uh, program, uh, but it is more of a you know network system. So not a single plant, but uh, interconnected uh, systems of, uh, of a controlled entity. And uh, we have uh, basically three uh, trusts. One of them is a distributed and time varying control of network system. This is a general uh, term. Uh, the second one is a data driven uh, control and learning, uh, which includes uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, and the third is a control of quantum systems. Uh, uh, and novel applications of control theory. So uh, if someone has an idea about some novel applications of control theory that is also relevant to the army, we are happy to uh, work with you on that. Uh, so how do we interact uh, with, with the uh, academia? Uh, we have several uh, tools, if you will. Uh, the most basic one or the most common one is the single investigator uh, project and it may involve two investigators in some cases and it is about somewhere between 125 and 150 thousand dollars a year and it's about three years uh, we also have a short-term innovative research uh, for high-risk pilot projects uh, it is $60,000 for nine months. And uh, if you don't have any publications, but if you have a bright idea, you know, we can support that. And, uh, and, and if, if at the end of nine months, you come up with something uh, interesting, you know, publications and so on and so forth, uh, it can turn into a regular uh, project, a regular uh, grant. Uh, we have early career awards uh, for you know young uh, faculty. Uh, we also support conferences and workshops uh, like this one. Uh, we ha we have presidential early career uh, award PKASE. Uh, it is uh, 
for five years, two hundred thousand uh, dollars. We also have a, a instrumentation grant of uh, two hundred thousand dollars around, uh, you know, to support the work that you are doing and to buy equipment. Uh, we also have a multidisciplinary university research initiative, MURIA. Uh, it's large multidisciplinary programs. Uh, and uh, I'll be talking about one of them, uh, you know, the count the results. Uh, and uh, it was uh, coined, you know, the idea was, uh, so I had a workshop like this uh, four years ago and where I uh, engaged with, uh, with China and others. And during that uh, workshop, uh, several ideas were bounced. And one of them was, uh, you know, how does uh, memory and uh, human brain and reinforcement learning occur? Uh, and, it, it, and it evolved into a MURI, uh, full fledged. So, so, and then uh, hopefully some good ideas will come here and then we can have another MURI. And, uh, and then if you have some ideas, you know, feel free to bounce with me, you know in person or you know, uh, email or however you, you wanna do it. We support minority uh, serving institutions. They have a separate budget for that. Uh, we also have like uh, grants uh, or contracts for small businesses uh, uh, and uh, STTR uh, is uh, bridging, uh, it's for bridging academia and industry. Uh, so many faculty uh, are also involved with small businesses and then you know, we support their innovative work. Uh, and then we make an announcement like three times a year. And uh, I sometimes have uh, some uh, uh, topics in that. I'll, I'll have a topic on uh, some control of uh, UAVs. And if you, anybody is working on that, you know, just you may wanna a look at uh, the army uh, SD, SDR, SDTR topics. So uh, now uh, let's talk about uh, some ideas about uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, as uh, Sean sent an email, let's celebrate. I mean, there's a lot to celebrate uh, in reinforcement learning. Uh, I think uh, so there are many accomplishments, but uh, I have some biased ones because I deserve what I support. <laughs> uh, the, the first one I did not support, but uh, it is uh, the Google's uh, 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 game of Go or mastering uh, that appeared in uh, Nature 2017. I think it's significant because uh, they used reinforcement learning without looking at how humans do it. So they start from scratch. They give the rules of the game and figure it out. And they figured it out and they became beaten uh, anybody, you know, all the masters. So I think that's a significant uh, accomplishment. Because before that, uh, it was, you know, just, they t take a lot of the games from masters and then they let, uh, the machine learn and then everything here there is nothing like that you know just start from scratch and reinforcement learning's power uh and another reason to celebrate is that uh, unlike uh, some uh, machine learning uh, uh, topics uh, reinforcement learning is on very solid theoretical foundation that's this, i think that's important uh, because you know using that you can expand the uh, and not use your way by doing that. Uh, and uh, of course there are problems, uh, which is, you know, uh, uh, algorithm performance, uh, because, you know, it, the uh, convergence times were slow, but Shen has done uh, some magnificent work, uh, the Zap, Q learning, I think that's a significant breakthrough uh, in my opinion. And uh, there is, uh, and speaking of uh, uh, encouraging, for, uh, so there is a problem with the state space explosion and then it, he came at the same at the time. <laughs> Van Roy uh, came up with some uh, 
very good ideas uh, on uh, how to select, how to optimally select data for reinforcement learning so that you know you can uh, confine uh, your state space. And there are many more amazing fundamental contributions uh, and applications of reinforcement learning. So that's for celebrating. And, and there's also some uh, thought, you know, but it, we, we are not done. You know, there's a lot to be done uh, because, you know, if you think about it, uh, okay, Google Alpha Zero has beaten the best uh, uh, chess player, good here. But uh, Alpha Zero uh, uses one megawatt of power and human brain uses 20 watts. So we have almost five orders of magnitude of difference in power consumption. And the performance of uh, uh, alpha zero compared with human brain is not five uh, orders of magnitude more, definitely not. So that means that we, you know, human brain does something right. And uh, there's a lot to learn from it. Uh, so I have a Murray, as I was talking about, uh, that was uh, inspired by a workshop like this uh, four years ago. Uh, and I, got, I was uh, fortunate to get an excellent team uh, by MIT, University of Minnesota and Caltech. Uh, and the name of the topic is Novel Mechanisms for Okay, I cannot. Uh, Neuroglia biocomputation and reinforcement learning. So basically, how does human uh, brain work, and then what can we do uh, for with that with uh, uh, reinforcement learning? So there were some interesting uh, results, and one of them is that yeah, neurons are involved, but astrocytes are also involved. So astrocytes are another uh, component in the brain. And it turns out that they form a network th that controls the uh, neural networks. So there is a hierarchy. And so it is not possible to do intrusive research with human brain, but uh, they do it with, uh, with mice. And you know, the Technology is, is pretty advanced, uh, not perfect, but uh, pretty advanced. So they did some experiments that are reinforced. You know, they asked the rat to do certain move when it sees a certain clue. And if it uh, does, then it gets rewarded with uh, some food. And if it doesn't do right thing, it's punished with a pup. Right. Uh, and then, <laughs> uh, and then they, they measure uh, the activity in the brain. Uh, and, uh, and then there are some very interesting uh, uh, results that uh, I'll be talking about. I mean, it is still preliminary, but uh, I think they can lead to some research ideas. And that's why I am uh, uh, mentioning them. So one in interesting observation is that during a given task, uh, they exhibit a mixture of both model-free, meaning you know, data-driven, and model-based strategies at the same time. Uh, so, and and the, they may coexist in the same task. So the animals have a model that they built, that they use, but they also do uh, reinforcement learning, like uh, you know, data-driven uh, uh, reasoning. Uh, and the model wins or becomes more prominent uh, as the animal is trained. So, so they are not separable. They are one and the same in the same process. And 
and you know, they were able to uh, observe it, uh, you know, from different parts of the brain. And then, you know, so I'm not going to go into details. And uh, learning occurs at different parts of the brain simultaneously. So it's not one part. There are different parts that, that are active at the same time. Uh, and uh, astrocyte, you know, so it's the other component in the brain. Uh, they also uh, send signals, uh, chemical signals, uh, and the behavior of those signals are consistent with the control and coordination of neurons. Uh, so from that, uh, I think uh, it is possible to infer that reinforcement learning is distributed. So it is not a, there's not a single, for a given task, there's not a single uh, Q equation, if you will. Uh, many of them, and it is hierarchical uh, because uh, the astrocyte network controls that behavior. It is multi-mode, uh, multi-mode uh, meaning, you know, just uh, it is both model-driven and both and data-driven. And it is integrated because uh, uh, so it is although it is distributed, but uh, they all go for the same goal of you know making a decision and, and learning. So maybe there is a way to integrate all these observations into one consistent and innovative mathematical model. And uh, and then you know just I don't know, I, I thought that some put for thought. Yeah. yeah, that's all I have. Any questions? Thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, we want to, the context is the following. Uh, uh, we think that uh, reinforcement learning is uh, one of the fundamental and uh, very potentially very powerful technologies for autonomy. Uh, but it is not easy to implement reinforcement learning uh, in real time, to say the least, right? Uh, but Hum humans do it somehow. I mean, we all we do reinforcement learning and we act in real time. So, and then you know, can we get some cues, some ideas from how nature does reinforcement learning, and then can it have implications for new and innovative algorithms? And. Uh, so we still don't understand uh, you know, how human brain works, for, but we have some clues. I mean, uh, so it's not a single process. It is distributed and in this hierarchical. And so these are facts. Uh, maybe there's some ways to tweak or that's uh, one possibility. That's one possibility. But what I had in mind is, you know, just how can we make reinforcement learning uh, in a real time? Yeah. Ben? Yeah, and also, I mean, is speaking of psychology, uh, you know, just Kahneman's uh, book on thinking fast and slow. Uh, it's also that means that there is a hierarchy in your brain. Uh, 
that lets you make a quick decision or stand back and think and then, uh, okay, uh, let, let, let me try to do something rational and thoughtful as opposed to like, you know, because there's a serious consequences. Uh, uh, and uh, and then it looks like uh, the astrocytes have something to do with that. You know, that it stops you because astrocytes uh, send some inhibit signals or there is a, your life is in danger, so don't do anything stupid, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> stop <laughs> doing something reflexive, think about it, and then act. Okay. 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 Thank you. I, I guess, I mean, maybe just a remark, it, it sort of uh, it reminds me of like in communication, how there's a whole architecture to make the things happen and there's no way it was gonna work, you know, in the 90s. Right. And then you have just this mass of people with new ideas coming in to, to screw things up. And that's what's sort of happening in control now. So, so this sort of blows out dynamic programming. You know, there might be some on some high level, there might be some tweaks, but, but then there's a way to do it. And it's just exciting. So um, our next speaker, so the, it's exciting to, to meet our next speaker to meet in the past. Uh, I while we were last together at a bar on Canary Island, working yeah. across to Africa and, and talking about neural networks. <laughs> and an optimal transfer. So, um, so you, you, you can go off, and I will, I will I'll sort of put that anywhere that works for you. Okay. 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 I can put in the uh, yeah. speaker. No, 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 like this, and it's very blur. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what? Could my one? Uh, so, can we quit, quit your mail? You know, they, uh, Derek uh, gave a very nice presentation. Um, we were funded, I mean, not on reinforcement learning, but on, uh, we had a group with uh, UPenn, um, because I came from UPenn, like Sean came from Illinois, I came from UPenn to Rutgers, but I was working on MEG, and we had McGovern Institute of MIT, uh, UPenn and and other places, and we were asking instead of rodents, we're looking with people. So basically, we're putting people to play something, so we'd see what they were doing. We would see this the the delay in response, and then we're looking at the MEG to understand what's happening functionally in the brain. We were sort of doing reinforcement learning, but we you can find a lot of things in, even in humans, and you can do studies with humans. But as long as you do MEG, basically real time functional analysis of the of the brain. So it's very interesting, uh, these projects. Now today, even though I'm not doing reinforcement learning, I want to show you in the case of uh, coupled dynamical systems. I mean, the brain has a lot of components like this. And I'll show you how to do on the spot control. Okay, you can do, and, and, the, and the way I'm gonna explain to you what we're doing with neural networks, what we're, what we're doing, the way we're doing it, is because I used to do a lot of dynamical systems, especially uh, 10 days, but it's a, a royal pain to make a really coupled dynamical system by hand. So by doing your nets, we go into the latent space and things become linear. It's like the equivalent of support vector machines where you find, the, but where you don't know the kernel, you experiment with the kernel, but you go in a space where control is very easy. And I think that's the key and that's what the brain does because, and on another note, when I was at Penn, we proved that 
have you ever thought why people walk so easily? If you do like in robotics, do relative angles, everybody's different. However, we found, I uh, built a ramp. There were some results by some people in Italy about the manifold of gait. There's only four fundamental angles. And looks like it's somewhere in our spine because there's no time to connect between your feet and your brain. But there's only four angles that can control your your walking. That's why, um, you know, babies do. You don't tell them how to walk, right? There's an algorithm there and they tune it. So it's these four angles. So the manifold of gait is four dimensional. And we exploited that. And we showed that even on uneven terrain, this manifold, you can interpolate it. And we showed the best. You know, the time at SeaGraph is the best graphics. We well, can generate gait. Okay, just and the rest is your weight, etc. These are called additional angles. So the brain, the reason why it can do, uh, as previous speaker said correctly, it has to be because it has very low dimensional representation. That's why you use 20 watts. So if you, that's what I'm going to show you today, my experience over the years with dynamical systems why you shouldn't work in real space. You have to go into another space where things become easy, okay? So let me give you an example now. So let's, uh, uh, what do you, uh, function, uh, which one? Oh, this one, okay, so you do this. Oh, yes, okay. Okay, so what I would like to do, instead of modeling by hand, because you know people are not the best in modeling by hand, they can do it for simple things, but what if you have a traffic scene, which is complicated, like you have a, I'm driving, and there are like a lot of cars around me, there's pedestrians. We're funded by the National Highway Administration right now, I mean, through NSF, um, so that you can alert scooters you know, potential danger. So I, what I want to do is only develop a dynamical system of scooter in relationship to other dynamical systems, means cars, etc., but also predict what's going to happen. And that's a difficult problem. So this is the idea. Of course, there's many applications, autonomous driving, robot control, control this, right? Interaction, urban mining, digital clones, uh, as I'll show you later. So the formulation as follows. Given historical trajectories, historical means if I give you five, six points of, let's say, somebody uh, tracking, can I estimate what's going to happen in the future? Um, and can I control, obviously, if case something happens up, abruptly? So um, it's multi nonlinear problem because the agent's trajectory is influenced by other agents. The agents uh, have varying plausible intentions and interactions and goals. That's where it, my next step will be, I mean, next year I'll to do uh, reinforcement learning. Why I'm here and I'm happy I met uh, Sean, of course. And uh, the obstacles can be static, dynamic, sudden. I mean, you cannot model sudden events, right, in advance. So, and I want to have interpretability. Basically, I would like to compute interpretable agent trajectory solution, the presence of other agents and obstacles. And of course, interactions, agent to agent or agent to obstacle interactions. This is an evolution of what I have been doing like since 20 years ago. So like if you see here, if you have a low traffic, I mean, if you take scenes in, uh, in uh, countries that are low, uh, very, high, uh, very, high, very dense populations like India, China, you'll see these situations here. But it's not only, it's more general, it can be any dynamical system. So previous methods were just data driven. What I want to show you that cannot be just data driven. You want to put modeling, but you have to put modeling in the right space. So age interaction models, for example, you use graphs, social pooling. In, in computer science in the last few years, it's been a plethora of papers. And all they use RNNs or temporal transformers to encode uh, underlying age and temporal dynamics, but in real space. But the, what they do is they fail to learn the align continuous temporal dynamics, and they cannot model explicit age interactions, and therefore they cannot control, obviously. Um, so this is discrete state estimation. I will argue 
that much better do continuous. You don't have state explosions and all these other problems that you know sometimes reinforcement learning has. Um, so what did we do, right? So we like to model an agent's trajectory, relational and temporal dimensions explicitly. Uh, we would like to model the temporal dimensions using neural ODEs. I come from Toronto, neural ODEs were basically pioneered there, but I'm just using the neural ODEs to learn continuous temporal dynamics. I would like to model agent interactions using uh, two variables, distance, agent, intensity. Of course, I can do a lot more if I want to. If I have more sensors, like you, I'm assuming I have sensors, right? Um, and I would like to do effective agent control without retraining. So what if I want on the spot, if an obstacle comes, I want to avoid it, but not to have seen a lot of data of avoidance. Um, and of course, we do a lot of experiments. There's a lot of databases from German uh, cities which we use. I mean, data is always an issue. So as we're going from ex extreme or explicit modeling to mixtures of data and modeling, we need, you need data, you need databases, but the data is never enough. So therefore you need the modeling to cope or to generalize what you see from the data. Um, so I saw this, what I'm going to present to, to you. So interactive system of all these, um, which is an encoder decoder architecture. You heard about chat uh, GPT, right? That's supposedly taken by storm, it won't, but no, it, 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 it uses transformers. So the encoder, will be, as you'll see, it'll be a uh, transformer, which is the evol You know what happens in computer science? And I'll tell you because I'm both double and computer science, but you know, they rename things and they say, okay, this is new, but it's really CRF conditional random fields with neural nets and we call it transformers. So it's much better, of course, because it learns correlations across a whole dynamic sequence. So it's much better. So let me tell you what we've done before, right? Um, in, before I wanted to model similar things, but if you work in real world space, you need to build complicated, highly nonlinear ODs. So, an agent with, you know, whose parameters are five, let's say position, angular velocity, whatever, whatever you're trying to model, which is a complicated function of the environment. And the way we model it is we have the, the notion of repellers and attractors, right? So a target is a repeller, is a, an attractor. The obstacles are repellers, right? And of course noise. And because your model is not perfect. But the weights are also dynamical systems. Like if you want to tr do a truly dynamical situation, then you have this mixture. And then we, you could prove recursively that this thing converges to the thing. So this is based on two key papers. The first one was uh, around 2000 with my student uh, Goldenstein, who's, who's from Brazil, but now he works at Google here in the United States. And uh, uh, at large, who was a postdoc of mine at the time at the time. And then we extended this, like, well, what if you have a very complex network of dynamical systems? How can you deal with the data structure so that you can update efficiently? So this was Leo Gibbs from Stanford, um, who we collaborated, who had funding from NSF. But this is, if you want extreme modeling of dynamical systems and interactions, of course you can control all this stuff. Um, but every time you do something else, you have to do a different model, right? So what's the idea here? Well, the reason why, I'm not telling you neural is the only solution, but it's a good nonlinear optimi optimizer. That if you treat it like this, then you'll understand what I'm trying to do. So let's say I have trajectories, lots of points, right? Uh, of different agents, like let's say I'm driving and then next to me is a scooter uh, or another driver, etc. it doesn't matter. And I have a few points and I would like to predict the following. So what we do so that we can overcome the limitations of doing by hand all this uh, modeling is I say the following. 
and that's where it transforms the vertex. So what if I encode all these points? And I'll show you how it's done. And then I, I summarize them in one point in latent space. And then in, in latent space, I solve an ODE about the future. And then I use an, a, the decoder to convert this now into real world space. Well, we're beating everybody now, uh, as you're gonna see. If you do that, basically I'm using, this This is the beauty of nonlinearity, right? So I'm getting all these interactions for let's say this trajectory green, I mean, I'm gonna do it for all trajectories. It's very fast. We don't have to, you know, have exhaust, uh, an exhaustive amount of data. We have a, a, enough data. And then I'll show you how you introduce obstacles without the change, without having to change, which I think that's what humans do. I mean, you you don't have any all situation of obstacles, right? You just do it in, a, in like in a reactive control type of situation. But your dynamical systems, what you have in your brain, you don't need to retrain them every time. You would be dead by now, right? So I'm trying in that direction. So basically, first step is that for each trajectory with known points up to time t, let's say I have 10 points, right? So I'm encoding uh, all these points with interaction of other agents into a single point in latent space using spatiotemporal transforms, okay? So this is the latest, if you want, where I take all the interaction from all the points. So it's not like a Markovian assumption where I do it per point. I think it's a mistake. So I do 10 points together and I find all the interactions, impossible to do by hand, okay? So the encoder can do that. In step two, is I use the encoder output as the initial value for each agent in latent space. So like SVMs, I learn what's the right latent space. This is a higher dimensional space than the data. It would go to a hundred dimensions from let's say three. Um, then I model agent to agent interaction use multiple Ds and each uh, OD as I'll show you in latent space. It's very easy now to write the equation. Um, and then I decode, okay? And I think that's the key here where I want to do reinforcement learning in the future. So this is the decoder, okay? So that's in summary, basically what I do. So let's go step by step, right? So what about the encoder, right? As we said, we're taking all these five points and I encode them that's all we're not eating. So encodes historical trajectory, I say historical, what you're dealing with for each agent into the latent space. How do you do that? You have the spatial temporal transformation. So basically, first you do a spatial encoding. So let's say you have all these five points. Let's say you, you have a sliding window and you the, the spatial transformer finds spatial relation between this point and all these other points. So yeah. up to two points. So you do five different encodings then this information is passed through the temporal, which is basically this idea. So you have five points, this, this is like a point. And then let's say the red point, this one, fourth point, is has interaction from everything else. But now this point is not a po one point in real space. It's the summary of all the points I've seen, okay? So that's the trick, what we're doing. So encode spatial relation this time step, temporal encode state for each agent. Okay, so now go to the next step. Since I encoded and I have this initial point and I can do a very simple, not a simple, but I, I can do now uh, the OD, right? So generates latent trajectories and decodes the latent vector back to real, I mean, that's the decoder, right? That's the whole process. So all this, this in your net, this is not in your net that takes you to the real space. Um, so how to model multiple edges with using ODs, right? So how do you do that, right? So I'm in mean latent space, yeah, this H, right? So that's the space. So the decoder for every agent, we model agent interactions with our agents and temporal dynamics. So how do we do that? So you see now the equations become simpler because I'm saying the evolution over time of the state is a neural net, obviously, which is a neural OD. And what is it, right? I'm trying to uh, 
encode features of states, so to say. So, so like in the lambda system, right? The HDT is a function of H, right? But a nonlinear function. And interactions, let's say distances. You could do other things, right, if you knew, right? I'm talking in, in car situations, the distance, but you want to go smaller, right? And so, but it's two things, not only the distance, but the intensity. You, you know, at the time in the old days, like I want to see what if somebody's courageous or what if somebody's uh, not so courageous. Basically, you can tolerate, you know, some drivers drive with very close distance to the other car, right? Or some keep bigger distance. So that's what we're trying to. Um, so, so that, that's what it is. So, the inter so basically, in summary, the interaction intensity computes how an agent affects the dynamics of the other agent. Uh, and the distance, the distance between agents. So, um, and you multiply them, of course, in this model. You could do other models, doesn't matter. Um, okay, then control capacity. You see, that's, you, you see how easy now it is, because now I can add control here without retraining. So basically, in latent space, I say, what if I want to do the following. I want to create a trajectory that goes to the target. So basically an attractor, okay? And why? Because back then, with because that's what happened, right? If you want to go somewhere, that's an attractor, right? So you, it, you see in, in, in computer science, people were spending years and years. I remember since my days uh, when I was a student in Toronto, we was, the best AI place to be at. I basically, I didn't go to MIT to go to Toronto because Hinton, a lot of other guys were thinking, were big thinkers at the time in the early 90s. And, but there were a lot of people who were trying to do, and they were saying, I'm gonna optimize to go from here to here in the absence of obstacles, or if the obstacles were, they were static, but that's not a real world situation. If you're walking, there's always things up, so you cannot model like this in advance. Right? So, um, so this is the latent uh, feature attraction, you try the distance between your state and where it is. So you're trying to minimize that. Um, another one is a repeller, of course, where you want to have this situation, right? You want to avoid it. Um, or if you want to follow exactly the trajectory, like in this case, then you put another type of control, or you can add them all up, depending, right? So nothing's stopping you now, and it's easy. In, in, in this uh, um, in this setting. So basically I can control an agent to avoid obstacles and or agents by modifying the OD in latent space without retraining, which is a big deal because now I don't need so much data. I can just modify, which to me, this is about, uh, a lot of you are doing uh, reinforcement learning. I, I did this because I strongly believe Humans must be doing that. Plus, of course, they don't do neural nets the way it's done because we have a lot of memory. So it could be memory neural nets, uh, computation neural nets, and all controlled. And astrocytes, I, I hired a faculty who was working with some people in mechanical engineering at MIT, who's now with us. And astrocytes, I know very well, do the control. But control models of reinforcement, I think, can be easily implemented in this setting. Um, so, and I'll show you a lot of examples of this. So, this is the attractor, the repeller, and the desired target, for example. Um, so, what is the data? So, I'll show you a lot of examples so you can see the behavior of this. So, there's a lot uh, of, of uh, data from German highways. And all we have is, of course, you need to detect the, the cars, the pedestrians, bicycles, all, all sorts of, and not only German highways, there are three different data sets. Some are highways, some are uh, the autobahn, some others are in, in cities, but not intersections. But at the same time, we also did our own data set from Asbury Park in uh, New Jersey. Um, so let me show you, sorry, results, and then I'll show you the experiments. I mean, the videos, so you can see what's happening. So, we can do forecasting accuracy on curve trajectories, these three different data sets, German data sets. And you can see we beat everybody. All this other stuff is data driven. Um, but uh, we can do much better. 
So this is, the metric is the average displacement error. Um, how about collision rates? Like collision rate means that if you're predicting that you won't collide with, uh, you know, obstacles if you have. So we also do a lot better than everybody else. Um, and it's this mixture of modeling with data and working in latencies. Um, so this is an example. So example, this is where it's going, right? And of course you want to avoid, otherwise you have collision. And this is what it computes. You'll see it in video, so it's pretty natural. So the same thing, you know, somebody is uh, moving like this and that's the, what it computes with control to avoid instead of colliding. That's another situation again, um, where green is the ground truth meaning without uh, obstacles, white is the prediction, and black is the obstacle, okay? So it shows you all these things. Uh, because this is vehicles, this is bicycles, this is from the data set. Um, obstacle level and target reaching. Now, what we do is, with graphics, right? We insert, so they have the vehicles going, right? We insert on the spot an obstacle, see what happens. So this is the computation of those. Um, uh, this is, of course, you can put weights here, for example, and then it shows you the ground. So you can compute different trajectories depending how courageous you are, you know, behavior of driving. Um, so this shows you, uh, you see the cars uh, and down here. So they're avoiding a score. Let's say you put a score right, it will avoid it. And we'll compute it so that makes sense, right? It's a dynamical system, after all, it should do well there. Um, so a car is avoiding a scooter, a scooter is avoiding uh, a scooter. Uh, there's another one where a car is avoiding a moving scooter. So what if it's moving, right? So, and there's another scooter. Okay. So you can do a lot of things just to see the behavior of the solution, right? Um, and, you know, of course, you can also show, you see all this autonomous driving, right? I know Tesla because Elon Musk who I don't have particular, you know, respect in his manners, but he was coming to New Rips and he would tell us, you should stop doing PhDs, we solved the problem. Of course, uh, you know, naive, right, to say these things. And especially because you only use uh, optical sensors like cameras, it doesn't use radar, it doesn't use, because of course it's expensive, he wants to make more profit <laughs> from his cars, right? But of course the cars will, if you ever use it, uh, you know, we heard what they do, they fall on trees, etc. <laughs> and the reason is they don't do dynamics. All he does is, because I'm in computer vision, all he does is takes an image, makes a decision, takes another image, well, it's a dynamical problem. The, the world is dynamic, but it's not about looking at pixels in it. It's assessing the situation, he doesn't do that. We have other methods, I can give you other talks, uh, you know, in the future about this, but, uh, and you have to understand, and people, why they can easily control this themselves and other things, it's because they do understand, they have representations, which are dynamic, and dynamically evolving. And if you don't do that, and you just rely on data, of course you don't get it. So, okay. There's another one where a car is avoiding a static scooter and reaching the target. So let's say you have a target here. Can you do it? Uh, and of course, in a way that's dynamically plausible, right? So a car is avoiding static scooter and return to the original uh, lane. So basically, it's moving and going back to the to the lane. Now, how fast is going? Of course, depends on the, on the car. But if you want to make it something autonomous, you have to have a understanding. You have to have sensors, integrate the sensors so you can control the vehicle, right? And based on the capabilities of the vehicle, you you can solve the problems. So this is from our own, right? So this shows you how we compute trajectories. Uh, green is the ground truth, ours is what we compute. So this is now a real world. So I have lots of uh, video like this we analyze and also on Rutgers cameras, because you know there's a big issue with scooters, right? They have, they're electric, they go fast, and they a lot of accidents. So we need to predict, you need to give them alert 
because we can predict the trajectory to avoid what's a near miss, right? It's difficult for us. But if you don't have a dynamic assistant prediction, you're not gonna, how are you gonna predict what's gonna happen? Um, so in conclusion, basically, we're learning continuous temporal dynamics with edge interactions using ODEs. We're extending, I'll, I'll show you in the future what we're trying to do. But in latent space, so that's the trick. If you do it in real space, very difficult. I've done it, and it's by hand and very difficult. So we like to model multiple agent to agent interactions based on distance interaction and density. I can deal with, uh, without learning case of obstacles, agents not in the training data set, so that's more a control approach. Um, and we have coupled DDS was uh, a big program at NSF, dynamic data driven application systems uh, with models, so ODEs and so on. So the agent adapts dynamically to change in the environment without learning based on changes to the underlying ODEs. And then we can have extensive, we did, uh, as you see, a lot of experiments. We have thousands of videos about ICE. And we only learn uh, learning based approach to deal with obstacles and not in the training data sets. So what we would like to do, because I think, it, in my opinion, I would like to interface with, with any of you who is interested in these topics, even though it doesn't have to be this approach for cars, it can be for anything. So I, I will, of course, I want to learn more prediction of near misses. What does it mean this is a dangerous situation? Think about driving, think about Air Force, Air Force once gave us money to understand fatigue, early fatigue, in, you know, in, the, in uh, using MEG in the brain, right? I did this also with MIT, McGarvin Institute, um, for data. So what does it mean to predict and so that you can avoid uh, serious problems, right? Any, in any dynamic situation. We'd like to propose trajectory modification to avoid near miss. Integrate with real time sensor information, distance velocity. So, what if I get in real time? So, this, this you see, uh, while training may take time to, 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 to pass uh, forward the uh, neural nets very fast, milliseconds. Okay? So, this approach that I'm showing you happens very fast. It's really fast. So, uh, and I want important show digital twins. I'm very interested in modeling super complicated dynamical like New York, like you, there's cars, there's people, there's the HVAC systems, everything is affecting everything. So how do you do that? Uh, and planning, autonomous driving, human robot teams, controlling heterogeneous agents, agents with different dynamics. Uh, of course, PDEs, if you won't have space time, you have multiple variables, not just time. Control more complex system without no knowledge of the loss function goes to reinforcement learning, right? Because Think about it, humans don't compute loss function. <laughs> we don't have the capacity, doesn't make sense. And the loss function changes over time. What we want is we have goals and we want to control our behavior to achieve the goal. And therefore, to me, my, based on the whole journey I've been doing all these years, starting with traditional machine learning, SVMs, CRFs, the dynamic versions of those, is much better to work in the latest phase where things are linear and then you can control things. So that's what I want to tell you today. And thank you very much. Thank you.